Good morning, Wiper Wesleyan Church. Who's glad to be here this morning? Now let's try that again. Turn me up a little bit there, Corey. They're not listening. Who's glad to be here this morning? Good. I was reading this week um, in the Psalms, that, and the Psalms ask uh, one of those uh, rhetorical questions. Who is this king, he asks. And then he answers his own question. It's the Lord Almighty, strong, powerful, and mighty in battle. Aren't you glad we serve a mighty God this morning? Let's stand and sing this little chorus. Mighty is our God. It goes like this. Mighty is our God, mighty is our King, mighty is our Lord, ruler of everything. Glory to our God, glory to our King, glory to our Lord, ruler of everything. His name is higher, higher than any other name. His name is greater, for he has created everything. Mighty is our God, mighty is our King, mighty is our Lord, ruler of everything. Glory to our God, glory to our King, glory to our Lord, ruler of everything. Glory to our Lord, ruler of everything. A little chorus we learned way back in Sunday school. Do you remember this? We're going to talk about the mercies of the Lord this morning. And this little chorus goes like this. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing. I will sing. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. We'll sing of the mercies of the Lord. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness, thy faithfulness. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing, I will sing, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. How about this? Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty. At Calvary, years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died. At Calvary, mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me, there my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me, there my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing, I will sing, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. Amen. Father, we come into your presence today. We thank you for your incredible love and mercy, for your awesome greatness and power. You are mighty. And no reason for us to panic or worry. you got this under control. We come to worship and adore and glorify you today. Be honored in our presence, we pray. In Jesus' name. Find five or six people you haven't greeted yet and welcome them to the service.
we have some announcements this morning. Um, of course, they're in your bulletin, so uh, make sure you take a look at those. We've got some important things. The very first thing, of course, is this morning, right after the morning service, is our general conference. Everyone is uh, allowed to stay and uh, listen to what's going on, but members, you're expected to stay. It shouldn't last very long, um, but make sure you remember that. Don't just go out and head off to lunch, but uh, hang around here in the sanctuary afterwards. Um, also, tonight, youth at 6 p.m. This is the party season of the year. We're finally coming on to summer. Sorry. At 5. <laughs> Don't pay attention to the bulletin. It's at 5 o'clock. They're having a party at the Rehoviacs. And uh, Jerry tells me that the water is warm enough to swim in, so bring your swimming stuff. Um, he also said that he's going to have smoked brisket for you all. Actually, he specifically said he's not going to have that, but I'm getting him in trouble. He's famous for his smoked brisket, so um, one of these days we'll impose upon him to really do smoked brisket. Um, but youth, make sure that you come there for that. Invite your friends. It's always a great time there, so make sure you do that. This Wednesday night, we're having more party time. Um, we usually come and gather and have Bible studies and things for the children and the youth. However, this Wednesday... We're all going to meet out at the pavilion and have our first summer fellowship time. So bring a dish to pass, bring some games to play, and let's all meet out at the pavilion and start the summer off right with a party. We Wesleyans do food really well, right? So make sure we start off the year with good food at the, at the party. Are we going to have smoked brisket? Jerry's still shaking his head no. Sorry about that. Um, you all might you know, put pressure on him too. Um, VBS, just two weeks away, so uh, make sure you make get your kids signed up, and again, you know how to do that online, or have your kid that's going to be there do it online. Um, there's some sign-up sheets out in the foyer for craft supplies and for snacks, so if you're not able to help in other ways, you can always do those things, so make sure you take a look at those. And I don't know much about this, so Wendy, you may have to fill in there. Ladies' time out is this Saturday, or not this Saturday, Saturday, June 22nd. And it's at the Toledo Farmer's Market. There you go. That's all there is. You'll probably hear about it again after that. So those are the announcements. Make sure uh, you look at the bulletin for the others that are there. So stand with me if you would. Lamentations is not a book of the Bible that I typically associate with encouraging words. I mean, after all, look at the name. It's Lamentations. But this is a great encouraging, encouraging Bible verse for us. And it is also the source for our song this morning, and also it's the source for our closing song. So let's read it together and read it carefully here. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. So therefore, guess what our hymn is this morning? Great is thy faithfulness. Um, usually tell stories about the songwriter, but this one I'll tell about the one who wrote the music for it. Because the songwriter gave him the lyrics, and he read it, and he was so touched by it. It was so much his personal testimony. And many times we hear stories that as soon as they read it, the music comes, and it flows, and it's perfect. But he did. He struggled, and he prayed and prayed for the Lord to give him the right tune to express the feeling of this song. And it does, doesn't it? It fits so perfectly. This is my testimony. Great is thy faithfulness. Is that yours as well? Now when we get to verse 3, pay attention. This is my favorite of all. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with 10,000 beside. Isn't that a great way to end this song? Great is thy faithfulness. Okay, be the choir this morning and let's sing it to him. Because after all, he is the audience. Amen? If you want the music, it's page 43 in the hymnals. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. 
There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above, join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Amen. Amen. Remain standing as we continue our worship. We'll actually let you sit down. Sorry, Mark. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Anybody want to give testimony to that today? Has the Lord been good to you? <laughs> Ouch. He is amen. Praise God. Our um, verse for life this morning, we taught you this little chorus um, a while back, but it was put to music. Let's see if we can remember it. It goes like this. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. New every morning, 
Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord. Great is thy faithfulness. Let's just try that much again. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion and my soul, therefore I will hope in Him. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord. Great is thy faithfulness. Amen. Well, kids, you're dismissed for junior church. As they're leaving, would you take your Bibles, please, and turn to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5. There we go. Good. I was uh, watching the uh, Women's College World Series softball this week, and uh, <clears throat> one of the games particularly was interesting. A girl from Oklahoma, who they, um, uh, they won the World Series again. Um, anyways, she, she was playing second base. And uh, she was attempting to catch a pop-up in the infield. And I'm sure that as a second baseman, she has done this many, many times in her career. But this time, as she was getting ready to catch it, the sun got in her eyes. And uh, the ball, as my father would say, hit her right in the noggin. And it... Hit her so hard, she went right down. Of course, they, after the play was dead, they came out and attended to her. They took her off the field. She was able to walk off her own strength. And she was able to return a few nights later to play, but not before she went through a concussion protocol. But that ball hit her that hard. And uh, I was thinking about that a little bit as I been in the study about the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. And sometimes we approach this, these like, uh, yeah, we've heard all these before. But when we really study it, it's like getting knocked in the noggin with the reality of the truth. I mean, think about this. We've looked at this already. Matthew chapter 5, it says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Are we truly poor in spirit? Are we spiritually bankrupt, proclaiming that without Christ we can do nothing? Blessed are they that mourn, Jesus says. Are we really mourning over our sinfulness and what our sin has done? Blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. Do we really hunger and thirst after righteousness to be filled? Or are we content with being filled with what the world has to offer? Do we come across, Jesus said, blessed are the meek. We talked about this last week. Are we truly a meek, gentle, caring person? I mean, the words of Jesus go right to the heart of who we are inside. They challenge us. They convict us. And hopefully they'll transform us. 
And if there's one thing that this whole Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5 through 7 of Matthew, speaks to, it would be that too often we are only concerned about looking good outwardly, but inwardly we can become far from the kingdom. And God's not interested in our superficiality. He's never been interested in meaningless spiritual activity. He wants us to stop being any kind of, of, of hypocrite of any way and to be real, to be the real deal in the world. In Amos chapter 5, God spoke to Israel. He said, stop your festivals, stop your sacrifices, stop your singing. And why would God say that? Because their hearts were not right. And this is what God is always after. He wants to change our hearts, our very core. And so we come to the beatitude this morning. Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. Are you there? And it says, blessed are the merciful for they shall be shown mercy. And this beatitude, if we understand it correctly, as it will to them then, as it ought to us today, will kind of make us stop and think, maybe knock us on the noggin a little bit. It sounds good, doesn't it? Blessed are the merciful, for they'll receive mercy. And I would think most people would even say that there's some kind of great human virtue in being a merciful person, that God would look kinder on the one who shows mercy to others. I have a guy that I love watching. His name's Charlie Kirk. He loves to debate people, and he goes to college campuses. And he was debating a student on campus and asked, well, what's your vision then of the perfect world? And the person responded this way, well, I'll just be good to everybody else, and in return, they'll be good to me. Well, that's really wishful thinking, isn't it? But that's not reality. That's not the real world in which we live. We live in a very competitive society. There are people who think nothing of tromping all over us and to get what they want, even after you've shown mercy to them. I like watching Judge Judy, as you know, and oftentimes they'll interview the litigants on the way out after the verdict is given. And it's amazing how many of them will say, I will never trust anyone again. And they're, in their minds, they have shown mercy and forgiveness or compassion and love and acceptance to somebody else. They've helped somebody in need, and those persons take advantage of them, and they will never do that again. We're probably a lot like Prince Felix of Schwarzenberg. You probably don't know him. You weren't around then. 1848, he was the foreign minister of Austria. And he helped to suppress the Hungarian revolt in 1849. And someone suggested to the prince, it would be a good idea, be wise to show mercy to your captured rebels, don't you think? And he responded this way, yes, indeed, a good idea. But first, we'll have a little hanging. Merciful, it sounds like a good idea, right? The problem comes when we find ourselves in situations where we're required to actually implement mercy. Because approving of mercy and showing mercy are two different things. And I think we're in agreement. Mercy is, should be shown. But when we have to practice it, oh, now wait a minute, that might be a different story. We want mercy to be given to us, but it's difficult to let go of the wrongs when somebody has done that to us. So just what is mercy? We've sometimes explained mercy as not getting something we deserve. And this idea has to do with punishment and forgiveness. And we can see this play out from, from the book of Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation over and over again. God's people had sinned, turned against him. They broke the commandments and, were, and where punishment was warranted, when they repented, God responded then in mercy. A great illustration of this happens in Jonah. Jonah gets mad because God, uh, he thought for sure that God was going to wipe out the Ninevites. They were evil. But when Jonah went and preached his message, revival broke out. And when God did not decide to destroy them, Jonah's not happy with God. And this is what Jonah says. I knew that you were a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, abounding in love. In other words, I knew, God, I knew this, that if they changed their minds, 
you wouldn't bring punishment upon them because you're a God of mercy. And can I just say this morning, thank God he's a God of mercy. Thank the Lord this morning that he is rich in mercy. Thank the Lord this morning that he does not deal with us according to our sinfulness. Thank the Lord this morning that from the Old Testament to the New Testament, we read account after account of the merciful God that we serve. Thank the Lord this morning that the writer of Lamentations writes it. We just sang it morning by morning, new mercies I see. Thank the Lord this morning for a merciful God. Come on, say amen. The Lord who is rich in mercy. Hallelujah this morning. The word mercy actually goes a little bit beyond forgiveness though. This kind of mercy that Jesus is telling us that we must have is the kind of mercy that understands another person's misery. Doing our best to feel what they feel. Putting ourselves in their skins, so to say, and then helping them through it. And think about it, when we truly have that kind of mercy, we begin to feel what God feels. There are two stories in the New Testament that I want to look at this morning that talk about mercy. And the first one, if you'll turn there, is in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18. Verses, it begins about verse 23, and then the verses right before, Peter comes up to Jesus and says, how often do we have to show mercy? How often do we have to forgive other people? And then he says, do we have to do it up to seven times? Now, this is uh, significant because the Jewish rabbis at the time were teaching that uh, you could show mercy uh, up to a person up to three times. And after that, it was unnecessary. So Peter is trying to make a point. He doubles it and then adds one more and says, how about seven times, Jesus? Of course, Jesus makes this hypothetical, no, not seven, but 70 times seven. And then he launches into the story. And he tells about a man here who is uh, a king who's going to settle his accounts. And he calls in all of his debtors and tells them you have to pay up. And one man who owes an amount that's too great to return, a debt that can never be repaid. And when the king sees the man, he says, it's time to pay up. This enormous amount, millions of dollars. And the man pleads his case. He begs for mercy. And the king, his heart goes out to him, and he erases the debt. This same man who owed millions of dollars, as he's leaving the palace grounds, he encounters a fellow who owes him a small sum. And he grabs the man, and the Bible says he begins to choke him, demanding payment. And when this man begs for mercy, no mercy is granted. Instead, the one who's just been forgiven has his debtor thrown into jail. And when word of this gets back to the king, he becomes livid. And Jesus says, in anger, his master turns him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. Could someone actually be forgiven of a debt of millions and be unable to, be, to forgive a debt of hundreds? We don't have to look far, do we? Sometimes you only have to look in the mirror. It's not uncommon for us to beg for mercy on Sunday and demand justice on Monday. The king in this story is God, and we're the first man. We owe a debt to God that we could never repay. Our sinfulness caused Jesus to go to the cross. And on the cross, he paid the punishment for us. He took all of our sins upon him that we might be forgiven, that the wrath of God might be satisfied, and so that when God looks at us, he no longer looks at sinfulness, but looks at the Savior who covers us. Our sinfulness took Jesus to the cross. The songwriter writes it this way, but drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Another songwriter, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. And what is it that the Lord's Prayer, we call the Lord's Prayer, what is it that teaches us to pray? Our Father who art in heaven, and then later on it says, and forgive us our debts, that's one translation, as we forgive our debtors. 
We sang it a minute ago. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied for me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Thank the Lord this morning He paid the debt that we could not pay. And on the cross He said it's wiped clean. No longer do you owe millions. No longer is the debt there. Hallelujah! Calvary covers it all. We owe our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. We owe our devotion to Him. Why? Because He paid it all. Thank the Lord this morning for Calvary. Now notice, in this story, it sure is easier to receive mercy than it is to give it, right? The debt owed by the second man paled in comparison to what the first man owed, but that didn't matter. The second man owed him money, and the first man wanted it and was determined to get it. Notice again, what did the king do when the first man failed to show mercy? It's interesting here that... Verse says, he handed him over to the jailers to be tormented. Is there torment that comes when we're not merciful? Oh, yes, there is. How about anger? How about resentment? How about revenge? How about bitterness that eats against us? I heard a good definition of resentment. Resentment is when you allow what's eating you to eat you up. I heard a funny story it's about a man who was bitten by a rabid dog and he was rushed to the hospital where it was determined that he had indeed contacted rabies. And at that time, no immediate cure was available and the doctor came in to give him the unfortunate news, you're not going to live long. The doctor said, we'll do all of our best to make you feel comfortable, but I'm not going to give you any false hope. You need to get your affairs in order as soon as possible. The man slumped back with depression and shock, but finally he rallied himself enough to ask for a pen and paper and began to write in great energy. About an hour later when the doctor returned, the man was still writing vigorously, and the doctor said to him, Well, I'm glad you've taken my advice. You must be working on your will. The man said, This ain't no will, doc. This is a list of people I'm going to bite before I die. <laughs> Bitterness, anger, resentment. It makes a prison within us. And listen to me. We become the prisoner. I love the quote by Corey Tenboon. She said, forgiveness is to set the prisoner free and to discover that the prisoner was you. That's what not giving mercy does. It makes ourselves a prisoner to our feelings about somebody. You say, well, Pastor Rick, didn't the first man have a legitimate claim? Yes, he did. He had a legitimate claim. This man owed him some money. But in true mercy towards others, we relinquish that claim. I can't, I've had many talks with people who are estranged over family, with their families over the silliest of things. Things that have been borrowed that haven't been returned. Things, items that were damaged. They got them back damaged. Money that was borrowed. Friends, these things are just things. Show some mercy. Again, Judge Judy the other day, a mother was suing her son. Suing her son because he hadn't returned the rototiller. After five years. Come on. Resentment will make us a prisoner. Mercy relinquishes the claim. I love what uh, Max Licato writes. He says, when, when confronted by those who have hurt us or damaged, he said that when resentment begins to set in, he says, look into the eyes of the king who wept when you pleaded for mercy. Look into the face of the father who gave you grace when no one else gave you a chance. I like that. In those moments, look to the Father and let His mercy flow through you. That's story number one. Story number two is found in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 10. Would you look there real quickly? And you'll recognize this story as the, 
gore, uh, story of the Good Samaritan. Now, we're not going to repeat the whole story, but just let me summarize because it begins with the question, who's my neighbor? And the Good Samaritan, as you know, this begins, I think, in verse 23 or so. The Good Samaritan was a man who stopped to help someone who had been mugged and robbed and abandoned by, uh, by the roadside. And several religious leaders who had already walked by the injured man, perhaps they were preoccupied with their calendars or their work schedule. Perhaps they thought the man deserved what he got. For sure they didn't want to get involved. At any rate, not one of them stopped to help the battered man. Then along came a Samaritan. He stopped and he put himself in the man's place. He took time. He cleansed the man's wounds. He even loaded the man up on a donkey. He carried him to an inn and said to the innkeeper, put everything on my tab. I'll pay it later. That's mercy at its best. You see, the truth of mercy here is that it involves doing. Because feeling sorry for someone or having sympathy towards another person's plight is not strong enough. Mercy does not overlook a person's need. The book of James reminds us of this. He says, if we see a brother or sister that has a need, and we say to them, sorry, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and we don't even help them, James says, what good is that? In other words, how can you experience the mercies of God? How can you experience the blessings of God and not be a mercy giver? James says, if you do that, you have no faith. Your faith is dead, he says. We come alongside of a person that's in a pit. Sometimes we have a tendency to evaluate why they're there rather than help them. For example, once upon a time, a man fell into a pit and couldn't get out by himself. A sensitive person came along and said, I feel for you down there. A practical person came along and said, I knew you were going to fall in the pit sooner or later. A Pharisee came along and said, only bad people fall into a pit. A mathematician calculated how far he fell. A news reporter wanted the exclusive story on the pit. An IRS agent asked if he was paying taxes on his pit. The self-pitying person says, you haven't seen anything until you've seen my pit. An optimist says, things could be worse. A pessimist says, things will get worse. But Jesus, seeing the man, takes him by the hand and lifts him out of the pit. Mercy, true mercy, sees and meets the need. Ephesians chapter 3, Paul says, We are filled with all the fullness of God, and his mercy shows through us. And what Jesus is saying here, look, you, you've received mercy from God. Now show it, live it. You know where mercy is uh, demonstrated the greatest? I think some of you will agree with me on this. It's in marriage. A couple I was counseling uh, years ago, and they were very much in love. You could tell it. I mean, when they came into my office, they were holding hands. And they sat next to each other. And uh, after I prayed for them, he even reached over and gave her a little kiss. And I saw them, and he would rub her back. And she laughed at his jokes. And then they had this kind of little inside funny thing that they kept referring to. But I noticed something. About the fourth session, they didn't come in holding hands. They sat at the opposite side of the sofa. There was no rubbing the back. There was no laughing at jokes. I saw a rolling of the eyes once. I knew what was happening. There had been a disagreement, an argument, and resentment had set in. They were experiencing what happens when life gets tough, and they were facing something that required much more than just a quick kiss or a touch. And I was able to talk to them about the importance of mercy. And by the next session, they were holding hands Again, I truly believe mercy is what keeps the fire in our marriages burning. When I said for better or for worse, I meant it. I meant even the worst. Is that not mercy? You know, when Benita was dating me, (laughs) when 
When Benita first started dating me, someone came, listen, to this, someone actually came up to her and said, you're dating him? In other words, you're going to need to exhibit a lot of mercy with that man. Well, I got news for that critic. We've been married now 41 years. 41, and she showed a lot of mercy, hasn't she? <laughs> she sure has. I think the thing, and we've faced heartaches. We've had disappointments. We've had disagreements. But let me tell you what's been at the heart. It's been mercy. Mercy. Let me, just one quick other thing about that story. Where are we to show mercy to? We're to show it to neighbors in need. That's the whole point of the story. And neighbors are everywhere. Every day we rub shoulders with people who are hurting and in need. And God calls us to show mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. I, I got, as we close, so let, me, let me tell you one more thing about this story of the man who owed millions. Go back to that one, Matthew 18. There's just one more point here. And this is one more truth that we must mention. Mercy does not cancel justice. God's justice is as much a part of his character as it is mercy. In fact, he cannot be a God of mercy unless he is first a God of justice. We simply can't choose to dwell on God's mercy without understanding his justice. And what did the king do in this story? He could have demanded justice right away, but he allowed his mercy to temper it. And then when the man who owed millions begged and cried, he showed mercy. But then that man didn't show mercy to someone else, and then the king's justice kicked in. I think this is the truth. The one who does not show mercy must not have received mercy. And that's a powerful statement, but I think it's backed up by what Jesus says. Just another chapter later in Matthew 6, he says, After he prays, forgive us our debts, he expounds, For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your heavenly Father will not forgive yours. In other words, if you cannot show mercy to others, it's doubtful that you've truly understood what mercy is. And listen to me, there will be a day of accountability. There are those who are going to stand in front of God one day and say, wait a minute, aren't you a God of mercy? Show some mercy towards me. And God will say, I did that at the cross. I did that at the cross and you failed to kneel there and repent and accept me as your Savior and change your life. And because you failed to receive it, or give it, it's too late. You see, God's justice will prevail over mercy at that point. Let's not forget this. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. There was a young soldier in Napoleon's army who had committed an offense worthy of death. And the day before he was scheduled to be Killed by the firing squad, the young man's mother came to Napoleon and asked him, show mercy to my son. Napoleon harshly replied, woman, your son does not deserve mercy. The mother answered, I know. If he deserved it, then it wouldn't be mercy. Friends, <laughs> None of us deserve God's mercy. None of us. And yet, he gives it. <laughs> Thanks be to God. Just listen to this. This is in Ephesians chapter. I just want to read a couple of verses. As for you, you are dead in your transgresses and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature 
and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But, are you ready to shout hallelujah? Anybody? Come on now, are you ready to shout hallelujah? That's the way we used to be. We were dead in our transgressions and in our sinfulness. But, because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive in Christ. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, it is by grace we have been saved. <laughs> Hallelujah is right. None of us deserve it. But God gives it. We receive it. The debt has been canceled. Now, let's be people of mercy. I want to sing a song for you. I found it this week. I just, I love this song. It's been on my heart all week long. It's called His Mercy is More. What love could remember the wrongs we have done? Omniscient, all-knowing, He counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, though, are many. His mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness and new every morn. My sins, they are many. His mercy is more. So the hallelujah for his mercy this morning. I love this verse. What riches of kindness he's lavished on us. His blood was the payment. His life was the cost. We stood neath a debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Did you hear the truth in that verse? Let me sing it one more time, just that verse. Listen to it. What riches of kindness he's lavished on us. His blood was the payment. His life was the cost. We stood neath a debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness and new every morn. My sins that are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness and new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. I don't know. Thank the Lord this morning. Our sins, they are many. But his mercy is more. <laughs> but God, who is rich in mercy, thank the Lord this morning.
Would you bow with me? Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for not seeing the debt that we owe you. Forgive us for trivializing that debt, thinking that it's not very much. We owe you everything. We owe you life, commitment. We owe you everything. You gave all for us. Thank you for your incredible mercy that does not punish us. As you look at Christ, you see him in us, and that satisfies you. We're grateful for the cross of Calvary this morning and for the incredible mercy that that is displayed and given to each of us. I pray, Father, that you'll help us now to take that mercy that we have received and you'll help us to give it to others. When we've been offended, when we've been hurt, when we've been pushed down perhaps, all kinds of things that happen to us when we've been forgotten. God, help us to exhibit mercy and to be merciful. The promise is that we receive mercy when we are merciful. And truly, those who understand the debt and understand how mercy works will give mercy. I pray you'll help us, Lord, because it's easy to say it. It's harder to give it. But remind us constantly of that debt that's been paid by Jesus Christ and the great mercy that we've received. And to be merciful, we pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Are we glad? Are we grateful for God's mercy this morning? Amen. Well, to close out today, we want to um, um, welcome in some members, and uh, I'd like for um, let's see, Dave is here. Come up. And and Gab is here, and the Irwins are here. If you'd come up, please. And also Gerald. Gerald, we're taking Gerald in by uh, transfer. So if you guys would just come up here just for a moment. And just let me say, we're so excited that you have decided to unite yourselves with this body of believers. This is family. And uh, this is really exciting. And uh, this church... It's been around a lot longer than me. I've been here a while and a lot longer than a lot of others. It was born in 1846, if you can believe that. It's been here a long time. And it's going to be here probably a long time even after we're gone, unless the Lord comes back. It's been a great place to be, be a part of, be a part of his kingdom here on earth. But this is really a defining moment for you because now... You've become the church in the sense of before today, the church belonged to you. But after today, you are the leaders and movers and shakers within the church. Before today, you were the people we were kind of trying to reach. But after today, you are helping us reach others. Before today, you were a fan you depended on our morale. You could leave the game early once it appeared you wouldn't win, but after today, you're a player. You will we'll depend on your commitment, and when it appears that we will not win, you will help us find a way to succeed. So today, you are the church. You become part of the church. And uh, I rejoice that you're taking this step and becoming part of this family. You uh, will weep with those that weep, rejoice with those that rejoice, and uh, work as hard as you can to make this place 
be the place that God wants it to be. So our church now has become your church. And more than, a mem- more than that, you become a member. Uh, and more than a friend, that's, you become part of an organism that's deeper and greater and bigger than yourselves. And uh, I just pray that you'll understand is, to me, membership becomes ownership then. It becomes part of who we are to, to own this ministry to make it become all that God wants it to be. So welcome. I have just a few questions to ask you, and you can just say I do. Do you have the inward witness of God's Spirit that you are a child of God? That your answer say I do. Do you fully embrace the articles of religion and the membership commitments, the elementary principles, the discipline of the Wesleyan Church? You might not know all that, but you've seen it, uh, you know enough about it. If that is your desire, say, I do. Do you recognize now your obligation to God and to the church and commit yourselves fully to contribute your time, your resources, your God-given abilities to support the gospel of this church as it fulfills the Great Commission in the world. If that's your desire, say, I do. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for Gab and the Irwins here and Dave. And thank you, Lord, for Gerald. Thank you, Lord, that you have brought them to this place to be part of what you are doing to reach people that are lost. And I pray that as members, all of us who are truly in that category, will realize the importance of this moment. This now becomes our ministry, becomes our place, becomes part of my DNA, not just attenders anymore. I'm here to make it work and to bless it and encourage it And I just pray that you will help them to do their very best, not for my sake and not for the leader's sake here, but that you would be honored and glorified in their efforts and in their commitment, in their love for you to see people come to know you as Lord and Savior. That's our ultimate hope and goal, Lord, is is for that to happen. And you use people here like these to share the good news, to live out that testimony of the good news of the gospel so that people will come to hear and to know the Lord as their Savior. I just thank you for them. Thank you for allowing them and helping them to take this step. We, we bless them and we encourage them. And now we receive them as part of the fellowship of this Wesleyan Church. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, I'd like you to turn around and, and uh, show your everybody. And so this is what we're going to do. We're going to extend the right hand of fellowship. This is kind of a tradition that we do here with receiving members. And uh, so we're going to start from this side. So get up and move this way, everybody. And we're going to walk to the front and extend our right hand of fellowship, as they say, to these who are gathered here this morning. Welcome. Welcome to the family. Welcome to the family. Thank you. Glad you guys are here. Dave, God bless you, man. Welcome to the family.